is really a guide to the selection, use, and care for fabrics. Now, when we, we use fabrics <laughs> for a lot of different things, not everybody is into clothing. Some of us are into sewn products, whether it be um, tablecloth, uh, children's wear clothing, whether it be accessories, whether it be fabric, jewelry, a lot of things we use fabric for other than just clothing. And one of the hallmarks of a good product, quite apart from the fact that your goods have to be labeled, is being able to use the appropriate fabric for the intended huh? purpose. So when we're looking at you going to market, you want to purchase fabrics, what do you need from the fabrics that you are going to purchase. And I usually jokingly say a specification is like a recipe. You have the ingredients and then you have the methodology for putting it together. That is what a specification does. So when we're looking to purchase fabrics, we want to make sure that it is appropriate for the intended use. And that does not at all mean that cotton is only for sleepwear, linen is for jackets, or trico is for nightwear, nothing of the sort. Because we can use fabrics in many different ways and come up with uh, designs slash garments slash articles that are different and have some appeal. And I told somebody who's in here, there's a dress out on, on the racks out there that I said the color and the fabric, most people will look at it on a bolt because it has no appeal when you look at it flat on the bolt and you think, mm, what could I do with that? It takes a real visionary, somebody with a design mind to see that there are possibilities. And it's to the extent that you can use some fabrics differently that you will get some interest in what you do. So you want it to be appropriate for the intended use. Durability is an issue. Now. We have to tie that into the market you are attempting to serve and the type of garments that you do. If you making short pants that are one off or that are going to be seasonal, you know, we talk about what are fashion, fashion fads and classics, yes? So if it's a fad, it's something that will come in and go out very quickly, you're not looking for the best fabric. If you're looking at corporate wear though, though, something that's going to be washed regularly, that has to be cleaned, that is going to be worn often, durability becomes an issue. And when we look at durability, we have, we're looking at different things, strength, color fastness, dimensional stability, resistance to things like abrasion, crocking, rubbing, things like that, all factor into durability. Comfort, comfort is extremely important. Now, Polyester is the most widely used fabrics on the markets today. If you go to the stores, more than 75% of the fabrics are polyesters or blends of polyesters. Polyester and rayon, polyester and wool, polyester and cotton, polyester and polyester blends. And it's that way for a reason. The technology, the cost, and the ease of access of the raw material. Now the natural fibers, cotton, linen, silk, and wool come from natural sources that are impacted by all kinds of things in the environment. Um, cotton is grown in the Far East. When they have monsoons, when they have droughts, all those will affect the ability, the harvest. Now polyester, we used to say back in the day, poly and ester, those two cousins that nobody was interested in because the polyesters we knew were these basic ugly colors and the fabrics were bland. 
Now polyesters come in all kind of formulations. They are doing all kinds of things to the fibers and the yarns. So they are adding crinkle to the yarns. And where it used to be uncomfortable because it doesn't breathe because polyester, if you look at it under the microscope, it looks like a fishing line. You know the fishing line? That's what the polyester looks like because it's a solid fiber. As opposed to when you look at cotton, you can see the spaces in the cotton. Now, those inherent properties in the raw fiber is what gives the properties and the characteristics of the yarns and the fabrics. So those spaces in the cotton fiber under the microscope is what allows cotton to absorb dye so easily because it bec it's very porous, it's absorbent. But it absorbs the dyes easily and it lets it go just as easily because of the morphology of the fiber. So if you're dealing with cotton, you have one set of uh, concerns. But the thing is, because of the structure of the cotton, it's cool. Because it's absorbent, it will take the perspiration away from your skin and it has good wicking properties. Think about a lamp or a candle wick that it absorbs the, the, the um, kerosene or whatever so it's able to burn. So your cotton is comfortable. Now polyester used to be very uncomfortable and you know what it is like to put on a polyester blouse and go and walk in tongue and it's sticking to your skin, you keep doing this <laughs> because it does not breathe because the fiber is solid. What has happened? The technology has moved forward where they are fibrillating the fibers. When you look at it under the microscope, you see in the tiny ends. And I jokingly say it's like teasing up straight here where you give it body and it's able to, when you twist it, it will hold together. So because they are fibrillating the fibers now, the moisture travels along the outside of the fiber so it becomes cooler. So polyester no longer has the, gets the bad wrap that it used to because they are mixing it polyester and rayon and the store clerk telling you is linen because it has that look because of what they have done to the yarns. But you're looking for comfort. Now, there are some fibers, like I say, that are inherently comfortable. When we design specs for particular garments, sometimes you will trade up one thing for another. And I will give you an example. For uniforms, uniforms have to be washed over and over. So if you're going to use linen for uniforms, it wouldn't work because it would lose the color because linens are not very color fast because of the structure of the fiber. The polyester, on the other hand, because of the way it has been dyed, it is dyed while it is in a liquid form. It's thermoplastic. Polyester is made from chemicals. It's a chemical fiber. The color is put in while it's in liquid form, so the color is locked. So you'll wash your polyester forever and ever and ever, and it keeps the color. But to make the polyester comfortable, we blend polyester with cotton, with linen, with silk, all kinds of blends of polyester. And I will throw this in. You don't have to remember it. We talk about blends and mixtures when we talk fibers. When you blend, it's like when you make fudge, the sugar and the water and the cocoa mixed together, you can't separate it after. When you mix, is like when you make a sandwich. So you have the bread and then you have the filling. You could scrape off the filling if you don't like it. Therein lies the difference. It's a simplistic analogy. But a blend means that you cannot separate the fibers, whereas with a mixture, you could physically separate them. So like shirt and fabric, where they will tell you it's a mixture of polyester and cotton. What it means is there is polyester in the warp for the strength, and the cotton is in the weft for the comfort. So to get around this issue of comfort, we need to look at the fiber content of the fabric. You see why knowing your fiber content is important? Ease of wear and care. And that forwards into design. So fiber content coupled with the design will determine if a garment is easy to wear and to care for. But when we're looking at the fabrics, how easy it is. Does it need dry cleaning only? So what some small manufacturers do is to over-label to cover the head from any possible problems. 
and then it works against them as opposed to getting the correct information for the fiber content. Now, you may have a fabric, like somebody has a color block dress outside, and I would hope that they would have put the pieces together and washed it to make sure that one doesn't run on the other. I don't have to answer. Um, but when we're looking, especially with the natural fibers, there will be some color loss. Sometimes it may not be that the colors fade, but how you will know that colors come out, especially if the fabrics have been like the natural fibers, prints sometimes have excess dye deposited on the surface and those would run. Um, some types of dyes, and for those of you who do fabric transformation, you know the endless horrors you have with dyes that wouldn't hold on the fabrics that you have, although you're using a mordant. And then some fabrics that have been uh, vat dyed for the natural fabrics, you will have some color fast problems. So you have to know how to care for the fabrics so that you can realistic label appropriately but to select also appropriately based on what you are going to do with it and i put attractive and fashionable last but for most people that will be the first thing because when you walk into the store what catches you is the aesthetic appeal of the fabric and then you may or may not try to investigate the rest to the extent that you don't investigate, the rest is where you may end up in problems. And um, having said that, when I talked about the color blocking, and I talked about this that this week in a class, and somebody said, well, that will prevent them from wanting to make a color block garment. And I said, then you're taking yourself out of the equation. All it means, and somebody said that there are some simple tests that you can do in terms of determining the color fastness, if you are going to use three different colors of a fabric in a garment or a textile article, you stitch the three colors together and put them in the wash and then examine them to see how they behave. That's all. If there is no staining of any of the adjacent fabrics, then you're easy. If it's one color, you stitch it to a piece of white 100% cotton and wash it and check to see if there's any staining on the white cotton and you're good to go. If there is no staining, you're safe. If there is staining, you know you're going to have some color bleeding. Now, what you want as the manufacturer is one thing. But what you have to concern yourself with, what does your customer want? And sometimes, what the customer want and what you have to do will never be in synchrony. What is the responsibility on you to educate your customer? How easy is that? left to be seen. It never is because for those of you who do custom sewing, when you try to advise a customer, how easy is that? You know, people come in with an idea and what happens is what people always see is how hot they will look in what they want. That's what they see. And half the times it bears no relation to their shape, their figure, their size, their height, their age, or any such thing. All they have is a vision, especially around Christmas time. The impact they're going to make walking into the Christmas party. So the aesthetics is important to the customer. The function. Now, most people, like I say, in terms of function, it must serve the intended purpose well. That doesn't always happen because, you know, sometimes we make some bad choices. So it depends on what you want the garment for because when you go back, if you are using fabric for school uniforms, you have to think is, what are the conditions of wear for school uniform? And especially for the age groups. Because what you require for kindergarten, child who's going to roll on the ground, pull out each other's clothes, is going to be a little different to a form 5, 17 year old young lady. So while things like color fastness is going to be important, the strength of the fabric is going to be extremely important. What else does the consumer want from fabrics? They want it to be cost effective. Not cheap, I said. Cost effective. That is at a price, price point that they are willing to pay based on what the needs are. Now, the basis of all fabrics are fibers. This is Textiles 101. 
And these could be either natural or man-made. We all know that, I am sure. And the fabrics are composed of yarns. And think about it. You have a single strand of hair. And your hair, when you want to braid your hair, you can put two strands together, three strands or whatever, to get the look that you want. Basically, that's what we're looking at with the fabrics. So we have the yarns. And that's what I said when we do the fabric count. How many yarns in the warp and how many yarns in the weft is what will determine the thickness and the weight of your fabric. So your yarns in the fabric could be, a, could be of a single fiber content or it could be a blend of different fibers and I spoke of that earlier. The yarns are woven, knitted or otherwise constructed into fabric. We get that. We have weaves, we have knits, we have different kind of weaves. So we have plain weave, basket weave, we have hung tooth. Now a hung tooth um, for those of you who did fibers, 101 is a twill weave. The same as your gabardine or in some cases your, we say khaki as a color and khaki as a fabric. Now your, simply what it means is the arrangement of the yarns at right angles to each other is what makes a difference. And some fabrics, because of the way the yarns are arranged, are inherently stronger than others. So a twill weave is much stronger than a plain weave. And there's a whole number of things that go into play. A plain weave in a single yarn is going to be weaker than a plain weave with a plied yarn. Yeah? So we have to look at that. Am I saying that you have to be a textile expert? No, but there are some basic things that you can make yourself knowledgeable in. Now the type of yarn will influence the fabric properties which will be things like durability, hand, how it feels, texture, the surface, resistance to pillin, abrasion, dimensional stability, etc. When I talk about dimensional stability, it's the ability of a fabric to keep its shape and size during wear and care. That making sense? Mm -hmm. So some fabrics have really good dimensional stability and some have poor dimensional stability. The natural fiber fabrics will always shrink on initial wash. When we test it, we test, it, test the dimensions after five washes. If the fabric has been um, of a natural fiber but that the yarns have good twist, and the count is high, which brings me back to sheets, then there will be less shrinkage than if it's a loose fabric. And you know that. Those of you old enough remember when they had something they used to call bag linen. And remember how that used to stretch and go all over the place because the yarns were far from each other. Once there is space between the yarns, it means there is space for movement. The more compact the fabric, the less propensity for uh, lack of dimensional stability. Am I clear or did I? Yeah. All right. Now, you find my, my, my shirt is linen. So if this is labeled dry clean only, it's to keep the color. But let me give you a bit of free advice. The dry cleaning is done in perchloroethylene. Yes? Before my time, they used to do it with what they used to call domestic gas, have the same thing. They call it dry cleaning because it feels dry. You can clean with gasoline at home so that you, the dry cleaning takes care of oily stains, not water-based stains. So if you dry clean, the research is that after five dry cleanings you should wash because the dry cleaning leaves a deposit on the surface of the fabric and if you've ever taken your clothes from the dry cleaner when you take it out of the plastic bag the perk smell hits you doesn't it now one of the things free advice again you don't ever store your clothes in that bag from the dry cleaner no you don't most of us think it's okay, it will be, we're going to be protecting from dust. If you've ever seen little brown spots on the garment after, if you have plenty clothes, you know, and you end wait for two months and you go back and you see some little spots on it, the perchloroethylene that deposited oxidizes. So, 
in terms of dimensional stability, what I'm saying is that the natural fibers will have some residual shrinkage that will happen. Now, fabrics that have been woven is woven under tension on a loom. And if I can quickly explain, the yarns are held on a warp beam at the top and at another beam here. And the shuttle with the weft yarns is thrown in and then it beat, it's beaten up. So it's tight. When you take it off, those of you who do custom sewing, you leave your fabric out on the table overnight for it to give, yes? Or you press with a steam iron, yes? Uh, or you hang it up on the line. You do any number of things so that, or in some cases, you pre-wash it. In the worst case scenario, you pre-wash, especially if you're going to be making a close fitting garment, so that the 3% shrinkage that is allowable will not change the dimensions of your garments. So the properties are extremely important. And like I keep saying, you don't have to be a textile expert, but there are some things that are pretty basic. And if you be in the business, you need to equip yourself. So the natural fibers come from plant and animal sources. Cotton, linen, rami, hemp, peanut, jute, sisal, and coir are the plant fibers. And you know the coir comes from the coconut. And we used to think they only use that to make mattresses and mats. Hello. It's now in fabrics. Uh, rami. Rami used to be an ugly fiber. It's, it's rigid. Now what is happening is they mix in the rami and cotton. What they do when they mix fabrics, it brings down the cost and it makes it a lot more uh, pliable and usable for a lot of different reasons. Pina from the pineapple. And somebody asked me, Lassie, fabric from the pineapple, and I'm saying how far removed we are. We know that the national costume in the Philippines is Pina. Lovely, lovely fabric with that same rich color from the pineapple. And they use it to make wedding dresses and the men wear what looks like a shirt jack, but it's a little longer, and the women heavily embroidered. Very, very nice. They seem to be guiding their technology very well because it's still not finding itself out in the open market, whether it is that um, we are not interested or that they're holding on to it because they have enough for their use. We have the animal <coughs> fibers, wool, silk, hair, or fur. And a lot of different animals now they are using... Um, to get the wool because you know the wool is the, the, the hair of the animals. Silk, spider silk. I'm sure we've heard that they have seen growing spiders now in the same way that they grow the silkworm. The silk is a lot finer but it is even stronger than the silk from the silkworm. It is not as widely commercially viable as yet and that is simply because the technology is now growing. We have different hair fibers, rabbit, muskrat and a whole lot of others um, and we know how expensive those can be um, because we down in this way where we're not wearing yes we're not wearing furs I don't think we are as attuned to it as as people in the temperate climes now we have the man-made fibers and this is where all the technology is going the man-made fibers could be of a cellulosic base or entirely chemical. What am I talking about? The cellulosic base fabrics are rayon acetate and triacetate. Rayon is made from wood, but it is chemically altered. And I went to a place called South India Viscose, one of the largest rayon factories in the Far East. And I, when I tried explaining it to Nirmala, I said it was like how the cane used to be for us long time. When you went to Karani and down south, they had barracks. Oh, they must be too young to know that. But <laughs> the, the workers used to live uh, on the field. So they had, I grew up in Princess Town, and I remember there's a place called Malgritut. And they had all these barrack buildings, barrack yards, whatever. And families, entire families lived there. And they would work in the sugarcane fields. And so it was like they were almost owned by the, the um, plantation owners there. I didn't say that though. <laughs> and I saw the same thing in India. 
where families lived. And there were these, I mean, as far as the eye could see, there were these tall trees. And um, they would cut the trees down and then cut them up to chips about this long and about maybe half inch thick. And these chips are then put into a hopper with the chemicals and it renders it into a chemical viscous solution. And the solution is then extruded. And the way I explain it is like, you know, when you have a strainer, we call it a spinneret, but it's like a strainer and you pour the liquid in and it comes out in long lines. That's what it looked like. It's extruded into either, depending on the kind of spinning, either into hot air in a room or into water. So it hardens. Again, I'm using the fudge analogy from liquid to a solid. So the, the rayon is a cellulosic base, but has been chemically altered because that's the reason why rayon is a weak fiber because the bonds in the wood and the cellulose have been altered so they're not as strong as a cellulosic uh, fiber like like cotton or linen now we use a lot of lining fabrics that are polyester what we call it sheet lining thank you sheet lining but you know taffeta all of us know taffeta taffeta is acetate and what happens? Taffeta does not have good color fastness. It loses the color. And if you press it, you realize that when you press it, the color changes and then it will come back. The same thing happens. We had something they used to call Bengaline. Remember that? Yeah. Old enough? Remember how Bengaline behaved? Right? It looked really good on the, on the bolt. And when you make up the garment, it looked fantastic. But it started to droop. It didn't have good dimensional stability. It lost color. It got holes because it is a regenerated fiber. You don't have to remember the word. And I usually explain it when I say regenerated, given a new lease on life. Because it started off as wood or the short cotton fibers that were too short to be spun on its own. And then we have the chemical fibers, which will be the polyesters, nylon, acrylics, spandex, and the aramids. And I will exp the, we, we're familiar with the polyester. We're kind of familiar with nylon. Although, like I said, nylon is more expensive to produce. Nylon was discovered before polyester. But it's much more expensive to produce. The polyester is much cheaper. So, like I say, world markets, polyester is the leader. Acrylic is the one we refer to as the man-made wool. Yes, we use acrylics to make a lot of sweaters and suits and sweater sets and things like that it's not wool but it has a lot of the properties of wool it's warm it can be dyed in a myriad of colors it is easy to work with it's much cheaper than wool um, and for those who have wool allergies which I never really understood until I saw somebody with a keloid on their neck just where your brake line is the, the wool jacket touched her hair because she had on the jacket with a low neckline. And that skin started to do strange things. That's the first time I understood. But you know what we say in the business? Wool is a living fiber, as is silk. Spandex, most of us say lycra. If you are not sure that your spandex came from DuPont, you had better not be putting lycra on your label. Lycra is a registered brand name. The generic fiber is spandex. And then we have the aramids. The aramids, um, and again, when we deal with people who want uh, flame protective fabrics, they say they want Nomex. Nomex is a brand name. The fiber is aramid. Nomex is the brand name for the aramid, again, made by DuPont. And this is the big question for all of us. Why do we need to know the fiber content? Because you have to put it on your label. Now, different fibers have different properties, and the properties are what gives the fabric their characteristics. So, for instance, I will say that cotton uh, is very comfortable to wear or it's absorbent. 
Why is it absorbent? Because of the properties of the fiber. It's an open cellular structure. Now the inherent properties, the properties that they come with naturally because of the family from which they come, affect the fabric behavior in wear and care. So like I said, cotton is absorbent. How does that affect the fabric behavior? It dyes well, but it also is not color fast. Yes? Knowing the fiber content allows the consumer to make decisions about the appropriateness of the fabric for the particular end use. And that's really important. For people who make to sell one of the things, customer loyalty and building your brand in terms of customers understanding that they get what they pay for from you. If you now... The fiber content has to be declared on your label, and I'll talk about that in the next session. So knowing the fiber content gives you the opportunity to allow your customer to make decisions about what they are going to buy. And it's the same labeling. That's what labeling does. If you know what it is, it's like not buying blind. You go to buy shoes, that's a whole other story. You want to know if it is leather or if it is a poromeric, if it is man-made. So you see some shoes that say leather upper, man-made sole, right? So you know what to expect. All of us <laughs> manufacturers focus on only clothes. And when you're, you don't, Oper you're not operating at capacity. What do you do? Sit down, moan, groan, and complain, and don't have any money? There are other fabric things you can do. Think. There's a lot of other fabric things we can do with ends of fabric. Uh -huh. Now, I'm not saying that you need to give up what you're doing. Huh? If you're comfortable where you are, who am I to say differently? <laughs> I said to this small manufacturer who was complaining about having gotten a loan from Nedco and things are not going good and I'm saying so what else can you do and she kind of think as well people here does buy anything and people here does travel a lot one of the things I realized when you have to travel what you do with your shoes uh-huh right I don't want the customs officer watching a plastic bag in my suitcase I too follow myself for that shoe bags and you know what? She came with her wonderful idea and she got so many sales. People were buying shoe bags for gifts. And listen, you can personalize them, initial them, do all kinds of things with them. Think outside of the box. Look at the traffic on mornings going down to Port of Spain. The mother hassled, the children uncomfortable. You want them to sit down, somebody interfering with something. There are these wonderful things you can put on the back of the driver's seat and the front seat where you put their crayons, their coloring book, uh, the bottle of water, whatever, so the car stay clean. Who is going to make it? Mommy dearest don't have the time nor the competence. You have the fabric, the time and the equipment and you want the money. There are things that we can be doing with fabric other than clothes. 